Well, hello there. Good day. Welcome back and welcome to my backyard. It is a nice day. It's a cool morning, relatively speaking, as far as the summer goes here. It's probably going to be into the um, low to mid 90s today in Albuquerque, but it's in the 80s right now in the, the shade of my trees back here in the morning. But I'm out here because uh, I thought it would be fun venue to show you that's right, another addition to my typewriter collection that I told you months and months ago that I wasn't going to be adding any more machines to my collection, but I've broken that promise because just yesterday a friend of mine gifted me this typewriter from his collection. And this happens to be one of the few typewriters from what you might call the antique era of typewriters that I was really interested in having. And I'll give you a little hint of what it is here, right down there. See that? What do you think that is? Well, that is a Corona 3. Stay tuned. The little Corona 3 is a folding typewriter and it is a three bank typewriter. It has three rows of keys and each type bar, each type slug has three type characters instead of two. So let's take a look at this interesting, unusual old typewriter. Starting with the left-hand side of the carriage, so we have this line advance lever that you push backwards. You can rest your finger on this little nubbin and this will advance the line. And this round knob turns between single line spacing and now double line spacing. And back to single. This lever on the far left is the carriage release lever, enabling you to move the carriage manually between the margin settings. This typewriter has a carriage release lever on both the left and the right side. A lot of later portables didn't. And then the lever in the back inboard of that is the margin release lever that enables you to move the carriage beyond the margin settings. There were various versions of the Corona 3 with various features. This one has paper fingers on the left and right side for supporting the edge of the paper. And there's also an interesting feature here that isn't really well documented, which is on the line advance lever, when you try to roll the platen forward, it rolls fine, but when you try to roll it backwards, there's a little lever here that engages the pawl and keeps it from moving backwards unless you pinch it. Now you can roll the platen backwards and forwards. Here's another shot of it from the back side of the line advance lever. And this little pawl that you squeeze enables you to turn the platen backwards. Otherwise, the ratchet is locked in that direction by this little lever. In the back of the machine, you have the left margin setting, which is a press and slide, like that. This is the spring motor. And the right margin setting, also press and slide. There's also a set of paper fingers that fold out, enabling you to support the paper, and they fold back in like that. Now for the right side of the carriage. So this lever right here is the margin release lever. You can see it pivoting the margin bar. This lever right here is the right hand carriage release lever. And this is the uh, lever that releases the pressure rollers to enable you to feed the paper into the machine. Some versions of the Corona 3 don't have this right hand extension lever for the margin release. They just have the left hand one. The backspace lever is on the right here, and it is rather convenient, although it is not on the keyboard itself. And this is the right-hand paper finger, which rides along the paper scale here, which goes up to 84 on this machine. It's a Pica typeface. So these Corona 3s use smaller than normal size spools, and they have an unusual winding pattern. The spool on the left unwinds from the front of the spool, whereas the spool on the right winds toward the rear of the spool. And also there is no automatic ribbon reverse. Ribbon reversing is achieved by tightening up the 
nut on the side you want to be the take up spool and loosening the nut on the side that you want to be the supply side spool. So when you get to the end of the ribbon you have to reverse the order of those. You have to, in this case, tighten this one and loosen that one. There's also a bichrome setting, this little lever right here. So when I type a letter you can see the ribbon lift. And then when I move it to the red setting, it lifts it higher. These two bars running horizontally underneath the vibrator are the equivalent of the universal bar. They operate the ribbon lift and the ribbon advance. One of the unique features about the Corona 3 is it's a three bank typewriter, meaning not only does it have three rows of keys instead of the standard four, but each type slug has three type dies. So there is a lowercase, an uppercase for the letter, and then a symbol or number. And those are accessed via two different kinds of shift keys. So if you type a regular letter, it'll be a lowercase letter. If you hit the caps, it'll be an uppercase letter. And if you hit the figure shift, you'll have the symbol on the top of the key. So for shift locking, for the caps lock, you want to push the cap shift lever all the way down and then you push this lever back and that locks it in place. To release it, you release the lever. And then the figure shift, you want to push it all the way down and flip this lever back. So what's happening here in the figure shift locking mode is the figure shift lever is locked underneath the caps shift lever, which in turn is locked by the locking lever. There is a caps shift and a figure shift on both sides of the keyboard, which is nice. And another thing that I like about this typewriter is, uh, contrary to a lot of portables of its era, it actually has the number one key, which is accessed, of course, from the figure shift. While we have the typewriter folded, you can see this little cover, which is accessed by two screws, one here and one here, you take those screws out, remove the cover and your entire escapement mechanism is right here, accessible for cleaning. And this bracket is crucial to securing the carriage into place along with this one right here. And there's also smaller brackets along here that hold the carriage into place. There's like one here, two here, one here. Those keep the carriage in place. How do I know that? Well, because I took this bracket out and the carriage came off and the ball bearings fell out, but hey, I fixed it. Spring motor is right here and you can use a thin screwdriver to advance the spring action to increase the spring tension by pushing to the left here on these keys. You can also manually pull this lever and reduce the tension, but just be careful when you're doing that. And it has a nice, sweet-sounding little bell. Since we have the typewriter flipped over, the space bar actuates this little lever you see moving right here, which in turn triggers the escapement via this lever here. So that lever back here engages behind this lever to space the carriage. And then operating the keys pushes this bar back which also triggers the escapement via this lever here. So it's a very simple mechanism. One interesting little detail I notice, the rubber feet are pretty squished, but they have the word Corona molded into them. You can see right by my fingertip here, the word Corona molded into the top rim of the feet. Isn't that a cool little detail? So the type bar rest is a thick piece of cork. That is, it looks like over a quarter of an inch thick. So Corona made these Corona 3 models from the early teens all the way up into the early 1940s. So they had a long production run. And there were a number of variations on these. Some of them had a actual carriage return lever. Others like this X version has just the pinch levers like this for operating the line advance and for returning the carriage. These were used extensively in World War I. There's a lot of photographs you can find online in the trenches of Europe 
Europe, doughboys or American soldiers or whatever, with these typewriters in the trenches. And oftentimes, or occasionally, you can find photos of them using the now very rare folding collapsible tripod table that was an accessory in the case for some of the cases of these typewriters. Those are hard to find right now. It's truly a portable typewriter. Now, there are some limitations to it, right? For instance, you probably wouldn't want to write the great American novel on this typewriter only because it is a, a little bit slow to operate with the figure shift and the symbol shift and the carriage return is a little bit slower. Uh, it is a fairly loud typewriter. Now, this particular model that I have here is uh, in great need of a, a new rubber uh, surfacing on the platen because it's really rock hard. And so one of these days I'm going to do that. I'm going to remove the platen and send it off to JJ Short and have it recovered. But even with fresh rubber, these are not the quietest typewriters because they're so open and everything is accessible. So there's really no sound dampening and, and not really any possibility of adding sound dampening inside the typewriter because it's just so open like that. But it is a wonderful, beautiful, old antique typewriter that really brings a lot of attention to it when you're at, if you take it out into a coffee shop or whatever, people really do take notice of it because it's so different. Well, okay, let's do a little bit of test typing, shall we? So we're gonna feed the paper in. The manual that I saw, the copy of the manual, suggests to uh, release the pressure rollers so you can get it started a little bit, and then you can feed them right past the paper fingers adjust it if you need to. After that, this is actually a little crooked. There we go. And where's our margin at? Back here. Move our margin in a little bit like that. All right, here we go. What is this? The 15th. All right, let's do that in red, shall we? A little bit of red asterisk. So this is uh, some sloppy typing and uh, I'm not quite used to the different keyboard uh, of the three bank typewriter, but it types pretty good. It's not a perfect imprint by any means, but you know, considering the age of it, and it really is probably the first true ultra portable typewriter and still is. In fact, I noticed even in its case, it is very lightweight. So what we ought to do is go and weigh this typewriter, shall we? Well, my little digital scale only goes up to 11 pounds capacity, so let's see if we can weigh it. And we'll see. I'm going to go to pounds here, pounds and ounces. It is 9 pounds, 6.1 ounces in the case, or 4,262 grams. So it is under 10 pounds in the case. Okay, I'm curious as to how much it weighs just the typewriter alone, not the case. It is six pounds, 10 and a half ounces, or 3,019 grams. Wow, that's pretty light. Just over six and a half pounds. So some of the things that uh, take some getting used to typing on this is when you want to type a contraction, like for instance, there's, or something, let's say T-A-G-R-E, an apostrophe is a figure shift. There's plenty of opportunity to make mistakes in all caps. Now what you can do for the exclamation mark, which is one of the symbols it lacks, is you simply do the apostrophe, which is a figure above the J, and backspace, and do the period. And you might notice the period key has periods in all three positions, the lowercase, uppercase, and figure shift, so periods are easy to get to. So anyways, that's how you make the exclamation mark. And it doesn't look too bad. 
Now you might ask yourself or ask me, Joe, how is this thing to type on really like touch typing? Well, I gotta say the uh, figure shift is really close to the A key, so it's the typical problem I have with my, my pinky finger will kind of easily hit the figure shift. So I kinda like to hunt and peck on this keyboard. It is really narrow. Um, I can though at times get away with sort of a touch typing position with my right hand and sort of a hunt and peck with my left, which is one of the th ways I like to type it. Generally speaking, this I think works best as a two-fingered machine. I think that's the best usage mode for this little guy is, you know, hunt and peck. And well, if you know where the letters are, you're not actually hunting, but you are pecking, right? So, pecking, that's right. Okay, so in order to fold or collapse the typewriter down. Let's take our paper out of it. You want to take this shift lock lever and push it all the way to the back in the unshifted position. Move the carriage a little to the right and then underneath the right carriage knob is this lever that releases the uh, rack ear from the escapement. Just push it and slide the carriage a little to the left until it locks. Then just tip it forward and it should center itself nicely on the frame. Just make sure the hinges are straight and these uh, are in the down position and this will fit into your case very easily. And then we will set the case right here and the typewriter just push it toward the back of the case and slide it down centered into the bracket. The knobs fit in there real nicely like that. And then the back hinges have little sliding pins and they slide like that and it closes down like that boom make sure it's latched like that and uh bob's your uncle well the case on this typewriter is pretty worn it's seen better days it really ideally should be restored but i did just clean it up and i like the little class which says corona typewriter company on there of course the covering on the handle whatever fabric was on there has kind of come off, so it's sort of the bare metal showing. But inside, um, we have a reprint, actually two reprints of the owner's manual, the Corona manual, and then it does have the cleaning brush, the wooden cleaning brush, and the little oiler pin. So the little oiler pin that comes in the case, it's a steel tube, or maybe aluminum tube, it's crimped on the bottom, and a cap unscrews, and the idea is you have oil in here and you just dip this rod in. It has a flat spot on the end and you can just drip the oil wherever you need it in the machine. And then there is a leather kind of sealing gasket in the base of the screw on cap that's supposed to uh, seal up this tube so it doesn't leak all over the inside of your case. And Of course, I wouldn't really trust it for oil unless I replace that gasket, but it's a cute little oiler pin. Well, someone asked me a while back uh, what was the one typewriter that I really would like to have that I don't, and I, I said it was the Corona 3, and that's really interesting. Uh, so a friend of mine gifted it to me here in Albuquerque, and I am very grateful to him. So, you know, these older typewriters, what you would call true antiques, they're not necessarily the kind of machine that you would want to do extensive long writing sessions with. And that's true, of course, with the Corona 3 because of its lightweight design and it's a bit fragile in nature. The metal parts are thin and things can get bent easy. But on the other hand, it's a lightweight typewriter. Even in the case, it's a small case, which lends itself to being carried around because you know it's quite portable. And also, I haven't done much what you might call coffee shop typing in the last few years for obvious reasons, but I could see maybe once in a while bringing this Corona 3 out and it would garner a little bit of attention, I'm sure, although that probably shouldn't be your first reason for wanting to go out with a typewriter because if you really want to get some writing done you probably don't want to be interrupted with people asking you about what the typewriter is but anyways it is a looker it sure looks pretty and it works adequately for rough draft typing it doesn't have a perfect imprint and it's a little fiddly at times but that's sort of the nature of the design of it well this is the corona 3 you wouldn't want to be jack kerouac and riding on the road on a corona 3 it's not the ideal workhorse typewriter but it is a beautiful little portable typewriter with a long history of use in 
conflicts and war by journalists and soldiers alike. Well, I wish the very best for you. I hope you stay creative and have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.